Thanks a lot, Lance. Uh, appreciate everybody attending today. Um, so what we wanted to do was just kind of recap real quick. Um, we're going to be going into some live demos of, you know, what is real-time security hunting? What does that mean? And really going through the whole anomaly detection process <clears throat> as we search through these large uh, communication networks looking for either security threats um, or even uh, call quality issues because you really need to be able to look both. And we don't want to have multiple tools for doing um, similar type of activities. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rich real fast so he can just give you a quick overview of the, um, uh, the platform. And Lance, I just want to make sure we did have a break in the, the audio portion. Are we, are we good now? Yeah, um, it's just a momentary break, but I can hear you just fine now. So, and I haven't seen anyone okay. on the audience chat in that they couldn't hear you. So, I think we're good. All to right. Go. So, Rich, why don't you go ahead and uh, take it over? Great. So, we were talking about threat detections and being a good threat hunter in the system there. So, where we have and what kind of ribbon has been pulling together is the Ribbon Protect product. It is a system then again that lives above the network in the EMS type of layer, OSS kind of level, that can pull information from devices called sensors. You actually collect the information, run it through different algorithms, looking for the different types of threats in the network. Uh, different detectors are then set up, and then you can actually respond, and you need to be able to report those incidents out to your users or actually respond to them through policies and being able to push policies down to the actual device himself as enforcers. That gives you the ability then to manage the network either in a act, proactive or reactive methodology that lets you do it manually or automatically. One of the big key items that you got to consider and think about is there are multiple different devices in your network already trying to do security elements within that. Everything from firewalls to SBCs, which are essentially SIP-based firewalls themselves. But a lot of those devices don't intercommunicate when they do see something. And that's where we kind of come in with the Ribbon Protect portfolio. Kind of a, a concept we call network or neighborhood watch list. And then the ability there is that if a device in the network detects its own type of security incident, that Ribbon Protect would be able to see that incident on that device and then be able to react to it in a way to populate that same policy, blocking a phone number or blocking an IP address on the rest of the elements in the network. So, so Rich, that's a really interesting concept. Um, how does that work in, in, um, you know, in a real network? You know, can, let's take a look and see how we can use something like Ribbon Protect Platform to actually pass policy over to a firewall because I've never heard of that before. Uh, a lot of our uh, customers out there, people on the phone probably haven't heard about that as well. So sure. let's, let's let's take a look at uh, a live demo. Okay, sure. So we're going to actually run to a, a recorded demo. And uh, what we've done in this recorded demo is we do kind of mask some of the IP events. Some of this data is based upon real live network events along with simulators in lab environments. And we actually run through this information and I'm going to kind of show you some of the stuff that we would see in the system itself here. Now, so what you see here is we're kind of logging into the system. The system kind of populates its main dashboard, giving you general uh, call trends analysis, giving you different statuses of the devices, and some kind of some threat information on the topology there. Uh, here we're kind of showing you the number of bad SIP messages that the system is watching. Again, Protect's not looking for SIP into the details of SIP messages. We're expecting the SBC to do that itself. Okay? So what we are doing and setting up in this system itself is that we have set up some alerts and have those alerts sent out to a phone number or an SMS message in this case. And here on the screen we're showing that we are mirroring an iPhone over to the screen here to show you what's going on. This phone number has been populated so that when an incident does occur, um, in the case of here, we're starting up our bad actor and sending SIP attacks into the system itself through the red screen. And as it's kind of processing through the network, 
Protect will then react to that system and send an alert out, here in this case, over to the user of the iPhone, giving the automated system the ability to reach out to an operator to say, hey, we had an event, here's what happened on the event. In this case, the system can then either be automated to react to it or let the user manually do something with it. But you see here a lot of the pertinent information of the incident that occurred, when it occurred, what actually happened, uh, very cursory level details is given to the person. Okay. So we then walk into the system and you can actually go into the actual threat dashboard itself and go into the application here. In this case, it was a threat exchange under NetProtect that would see and show you the incident. We detected the incident in the threat exchange, and then we see that it popped up from that, and we then jump in and just check out the incident table. Like we talked about earlier in some of our discussions here, that the incidents are the suspect threats that are kind of going through your network or attacking or hitting your network. So in this case, we go to the table and we look for the active incident. So here in this case, you do see the, the little blurry protecting the innocent here, hiding all the other Waldos in the network, um, just from a policy protection aspect. But you see that the incident is raised in this case. Okay. We then can go back into the threat dashboard itself. We can see here in the different graphs of the information showing what's kind of been reporting. In this case, we can see that there has been an increment in the bad messages been reporting by the dashboard. Okay. Next, we can proceed then and kind of show what was going on with that and how to react to it. So in this case here, now we're actually showing the receiving end of those SIP messages. Each one of these lines is that SIP message coming in from the earlier bad actor in the red picture. All those IPC and pings are kind of coming into the network, they're either probing the network, looking for issues, looking for some hole to get into your network itself. Okay? So at this case now that we can go through and we saw the active incident earlier. Okay? We then can jump here. Now, this is just to kind of show you, in this case, the firewall connectivity here is actually through a Palo Alto firewall in this network. We can then review and see that there are no current fire rules for the attacker that we denoted in the system. We can then go back into protect and actually start to manage that. We can look into it and make a decision on how we want to mitigate this access. Since this was an IP-based SIP information, the SBC did provide us with IP address information for it. So we can either decide that we know we can ignore the incident or we should block the incident. Now this is all mitigated manually, but the system could be set up that you could allow the system to automatically take these actions and then potentially even do them temporarily and then remove them from the system after that on an automated basis. So you would then make a decision, and in this case, we're going to mitigate this. We're going to push a block IP address out into the network based upon the policies here. Ribbon Protect has acknowledged that we want to go ahead and mitigate the system. We then can verify and look at some of the statuses if we want to, to see that that now incident is being actively worked by Protect, mitigating. It is sending all the rules and policies that were pre-configured out into the SPCs, uh, PSXs if you have them, or even out into the different uh, firewalls or other devices in the network that we have as enforcers. So in this case here, we see, we get, again, we're looking at the receiving end of this, and we're seeing as time goes on, the attacks actually did stop. And we can even doubly verify for the purposes here in the demonstration that going into the Palo Alto firewall, and see here that a new rule actually has been added based upon the IP address that was detected by the protect system. Okay. We can then go back again, re-verify if we want to check and see the incident state. 
right? It goes from a monitoring state, which is when you, or sorry, uh, from the monitoring state into a monitor state, which at this point, it's doing a standard audit. It's checking the system to make sure that it is in there and it must continuously adjust to ensure that what was chosen and decided by the customer or the operator is in there. We are now then check it that if that monitoring state in the audit has occurred, we move into a closed state. We can then confirm the mitigation status over in the threat management access. We can look into the IP address that we pushed the block. We can see here that it has been mitigated. You can check various levels if you want to see what was going on in the life cycle of it. You can see that it has been secured, that that port is now blocked. At this point, we can now make the decision that, oh, I understand what that rule was, what kind of occurred in the system, and what was managed by it. And I actually want to remove what Protect had done. Hey, Rich, real quick uh, question. Do I have to set up this policy mitigation for each separate device, or can I group them? Can I, can I, you know, say my SBCs and um, and Palo Altos, and just spread it across all of the network elements, or or do I have to do them individually? No, oh, great question, Walter. Yeah, so we did talk about device management before, and as you add the devices, the different sensors and enforcers into the system, you can set them up in groups of devices or individual devices themselves. And then you can actually define policies or um, methods to manage them individually based upon that. So the different events or incidents that occur can be pushed out to different sets of devices or different groups. So I have an east coast, west coast, to ingress, egress, or just network wide. So, so I have a lot of flexibility in terms of how I want to set up these uh, different types of mitigations. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So in this case here, we went, we clicked on in the revert status. So we did see that it was pushed into the device type Palo Alto. As we click the revert, and then the protect system is going to go ahead and remove that. Again, we see here the receiving end that's not receiving any packets. And as that policy then uh, would be removed, we click and activate it now. Yes, we're sure we want to do it. Protect acknowledges that happened. And then that block at the Palo Alto firewall is now being removed. And then the attacker's data flow will can then go through the firewall and back into the network, hitting again that system. You see here that the IP packets now have resumed back into the network itself. And then we can just foreclosure here, log into the Palo Alto firewall, and see that that is removed. Now, for the purposes of the demo, we are logging in and showing the EMS for the power of the firewall, but in an actual operation state, you wouldn't be doing this. Uh, Protect has all those statuses. If there's an error, if there's an occurrence, Protect would report that something occurred when it tried to push those policies. So you wouldn't actually be logging into the device individually. That kind of defeats the purpose. You need right. that system to automate it. Right. But for the demo, you need to be able to see that it actually happened. <laughs> yes. So that was great, uh, Rich. Uh, uh, Really appreciate you, you know, walking through us uh, with that. So let's just uh, quickly go back um, uh, to a couple uh, slides here, um, kind of set up our ne next discussion area. And as my computer is thinking. Okay. So we talked about uh, the securing the networks, and we, I think we have a pretty good understanding of how that works. So let's talk about just some of the other uh, aspects. So last time we talked about the TDOS, um, where even the toll fraudsters, you know, made mistakes. The um, international person was calling into um, some, uh, trying to make toll fraud uh, calls through Australia, but he prefixed it with a 000. Subsequently, he was uh, initiating a TDOS attack against emergency agents. Because 000 is 911 in Australia. Exactly. So the local residents, they couldn't reach any of the emergency services. And what we described was that with Ribbon, something like Ribbon Protect, through its behavioral analytics, would be able to go in, pass policy back down into the network, just as you described before, 
um, to be able to stop that network attacker at the edge. Yeah, and in this case, if you recall, the individual SBC should be doing their job and would prevent similar types of things, but this was a distributed attack into the network where there was enough or a low enough amount of traffic going through each individual SBC that it wasn't detected. Uh, it only was then seen as the effect of it when it was all then collected back at the end of the, the PSAP or the emergency alert center that they are all getting this traffic from the multiple devices that are distributed throughout the network. Exactly. So let's go in and see how this kind of works in, uh, uh, in, in practicality. So again, we have a, a simulated demo to protect the innocent. So nobody takes screenshots and actually uh, uh, makes phone calls out to people that they shouldn't. Great. And this one here again, we kind of showing through, walking you through, logging into the system itself. You see the same initial dashboard with the different information of the network can give you a high level uh, capability. Now, all this is customizable. Some of these the dashboards and stuff you see here, this is kind of some built-in items that we have, but all this can be customized to show the trends and the health of your network that Protect is working to uh, be the defensive. And I notice you can even see the geographic map so you can get a location of where those threats may actually be occurring. Absolutely. So, in the case here, we went ahead and jumped into our threat dashboard, taking the next look at the level of what's going on there. Um, in the case here, we are looking for call rate exceeded events. And in the system here, you see that there's just a, a nominal number going through in the system itself. We'll then kind of walk through some of the detection capability and provisioning it. I know we talked about some of the other sessions, how you do that. Uh, again, just like in the last demo, um, we're going to walk through and show you kind of what's going on in the system here. In this case, we're going to show you the element management system within the SBC itself. So this attack here is going to um, actually go in through the SBC and hit the internal side of the network. So what we see here is we know that the attack, as we set it up, is going to be a 558 prefix. But you see here in the SBC itself, we can verify there is no attack. So there's no policy been pushed into it previously. Again, this was just being able to show, prove out for the demo purposes of what's going on in the network itself. We then would be activating the actual uh, simulator, simulating the attack of the system, and driving that traffic in to the system to go over that TDOS event. Okay? So, but before you do that, you would want to set up your detectors. In this case, we talked about some of the detector capability in the past sessions. And here, what you see is some of the variable capabilities. You want to set the interval length. So we're looking for, this is a time-based event. It's an aggregation of data over time. So this threat itself is not one call. One call is not a threat in this case. It's not one call is not an issue. It's the excessive amount of calls over a duration of time that's eating up all of the traffic or all the uh, capacity or performance of your network itself. So in this case, we are looking for an interval length of within a 15-minute interval if there are more than 2,000 calls occurring within that 15-minute interval over two intervals and using a group suffix wildcard of four. So we would do an NPA, an XX, and then whatever number after that, we treat that as a family of numbers so we can capture it at a larger group level. Okay. You set that, that case um, for this detector is set up and prepared to ready to watch it in the network itself. And you see here that it is enabled and activated in the system itself. Now, since we have this detector, we talked about 15 minutes. Obviously, within this demonstration, we've accelerated time a little bit. So those occurrences would happen because we're not going to sit here for 30 minutes uh, looking and waiting for this to happen. Okay? But we will show in the simulation here, this is the app server, the endpoint, the CRE, whatever it is on the internal side of the network being the receiver end of the call processing after the SBC. The green set on this case was our simulator simulating the TDOS event occurring. So we are sending an enormous and an, an, an large <laughs> number of calls to uh, attack the system here. And you see it ramping up on the number of messages going into the system there. Okay, now we again, through the magic of video, time splicing, we accelerate this throughout, 
and Protect then sees it in its two events over two 15-minute periods and alerts the network that it does detect the system. Now that the detector has identified the suspect in the system, that was one interval. It looks for the second one, that's the loopback. It is then elevated to an actual incident in the system. So if it just happens one time, we don't care, but if it continues to happen, that is a, a, an actual TDOS kind of event in the system. We are then going back to our incident table, looking for that 558 prefix, because we know that's kind of what forced it. We see it's activated. We can go in and look for the details of the system itself, of the actual incident that occurred. We are getting our uh, handy dandy little option here, menu, that we can then decide what we want to do about that. Uh, if we know that this is a school sending out a bunch of alerts to the family members, well then we don't care. We want to let that go through and we would ignore this incident. But since it's not, we would go ahead and block it. Again. We talk about this. This is the manual activation of it. So the user saw some sort of incident, they assessed the incident, and then made the decision and pushed the mitigation down on it. If you wanted to, you can set this up to be completely automated by the Protect system. There are also time to live or TTL rules within the policies that can be set up for hours, minutes, or days that you activate these rules. They can push the policies down and then automate the uh, reversing of those policies so that you really don't have to be sitting here monitoring and actually be fully automated, giving you a better level of protection in your system itself. Here now you see uh, we activated the mitigation, it protects running through the mitigation, we check the different statuses of that, looking at the different tables just to show what's going on. Uh, we are mitigating here. You see that the calls are impacting the in-depth SIP service here the app server, so to speak. You see the calls changing there in the message blue. Once the mitigation is enacted on the SBC and blocking, you see that the message is going to stop occurring. So we can see here now the threat actor we did talk about is an MPA and XX. The four digits don't matter. We were looking at that level. So because we're looking at the network-wide capability, a large amount, because a lot of the bad actors change. Uh, here we're checking the life cycle, and we can see the life cycle of this incident that it is now in a monitor state. That means that Protect has activated the mitigation, pushed the policy out to the devices, and now is ensuring that the device actually took the policy change itself. Once that has occurred, we are going to a closed state, and now we have the ability to reverse that if we wanted to. So we see that now we're mitigated. We can jump back over to the SBC, look at the different rules in the system, and see that, lo and behold, Protect has now pushed a new rule to block that DN or those numbers coming into the SBC, preventing them from affecting the actual internal network system. So all the calls now are being dropped at the SBC itself. But you see here that our simulated attacker continues to generate packets and still tries to drive the attack into the system, but it's now being stopped at the SBC level, where the network events or the network devices themselves are supposed to be uh, doing their job, right? And Protect is just helping them do their job by sharing the information and looking for threats and issues that they do not see. Now, we're actually going to walk through a mitigation itself and show that the activity then will kind of will turn back on as the SPC stops blocking those calls. Um, here in the system here, we did show you the block of it, but we're actually going to go in and let's see the actual attempts and that the SPC is dropping these calls. You see the number of call attempts coming in and the call completion. The call attempts are the calls coming to the SPC. The call completions would be the calls it lets through the SPC. And you see here that the call attempts continue row, but the completions do not because we push the block and the SBC is effectively dropping these calls at the SBC before we get into the network. Okay. Again, just as we did in the previous one, we can see what the policy that's actually being pushed, the actual devices is being pushed out to. 
what was the incident type being defined, and then go ahead and revert that or remove that policy from the system so we can go back to the previous state. Protect is now working through that policy change. You can see it's working in and reverting that capability or the block that was pushed into the SBC, that VN558. Log into the SEC. We can check the blocking procedures there and see that the block list now has removed the 558 from the list. So at that point now, you see that there are messages reoccurring going from our simulated TDOS attack all the way through the SEC and hitting our internal network. At this point, from the protect system side, it would then be treating this as a new incident being occurred because that old incident was dealt with and managed, and now it's going through the detector system again and would flag that reoccurring. Awesome. Great, Rich. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, that was very informative on how you can stop a uh, TDOS attack. So let's... Um, and Walter, a lot of these demos, we are showing the videos here because we have a, a large audience that we're kind of dealing with uh, various uh, people, people and stuff. We have the capability to do these demos and these systems based upon the customer information themselves. So, I mean, if the customer was interested and said, hey, you know, we had this occur, we have a bunch of CDRs and data from our network, can you show us how this would work? They could bring that to us, and we could load that into our own lab system and demo systems and show them how Protect would react to it. We could be able to simulate their traffic that they saw, and we can show them the events and occurrences in their own data through our system. And I know we've done that before and actually found incidents uh, at customer site uh, with customers' data that they had no idea about, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because when you get into this, this is big data, right? So we have our own data engineers and data scientists that are involved in this. Uh, with some of our larger customers, they too have that. And it's not the case of their data scientists can't do this. This protects just a tool. It's a tool that either you use our capabilities and what we've provided for the detectors, or it's a tool that your data scientists or operational engineers would use to set up your own detectors, capability, threshold levels to be able to protect the system itself. So we can either do that completely through our own uh, subject matter experts or just use it as a tool with your own. Awesome. So last time we also talked about, you know, not all the, the threats are just bad guys trying to hack in. You may have some type of rogue network device that is uh, causing issues to call quality or you may have capacity issues um, that you may not know about. You may, you know, why are calls not, not completing and being disconnected? You know, is it because of insufficient resources or some other type of issue that may be happening? Um, so how can you use this platform to be able to detect those anomalies that are affecting call quality or any type of congestion in the network. Yeah, and let's be honest, like call quality is one of the biggest threats. Because if you have bad quality, poor quality, you're going to lose customers. Yeah, you're going to go somewhere else. Absolutely. So why don't we dive into actually a live system as opposed to the videos. Uh, if I can get my mouse cursor here. Maybe take a look at some of the things that we can do. Great. So you saw in some of the demos, the videos we are running, this is the same system. Um, obviously, some of the interfaces may be varied, but we're constantly improving this based on feedback we get from the field, running continuous builds that improve the look, the feel, and the interaction along with the algorithm of the system itself. So let's go ahead and just jump to the general dashboards. Here, this capability, you can build your own dashboard based on the different amounts of information coming in, set up different things. In this case, let's go ahead and jump to our favorites because we're going to, we're a quality engineer. We're, we're an operator there. And, and running through that. So first of all, we probably just let's look at the network. Big big picture, take a look at the network, let's see what's kind of going on in our network here. Here in this dashboard, you see there's four different slides or charts, excuse me, um, cover everything from calculating ASR and NER at the network level, showing your PDD or your post dial delay, and your average hold time for your calls to your network itself. Uh, providing you some different network-wide egress jitter capabilities. So the call is kind of going through your network, and what are we seeing on the call quality of that? 
and just kind of as a capability, just showing you all the different call volume by hours of the day going through the system here. And honestly, looking at this macro lot picture, you don't see any, nothing really jumps out, right? But what we can do is we can link in and go jump kind of to the next level of the network here. Start peeling the onion back, so to speak, to see, take a look at what's going on. So now we're taking a bigger or a, more of a tighter view, zooming in to see at a gateway and a trunk group level what's going on. Again, this is a different dashboard. You see a timestamp at the bottom, which is actually live now running uh, simulated traffic through the system. You can see various different information thrown up there. Again, you see the post dial delay, the average hold time uh, based upon a country code. So if you wanted to see, is there something going on based upon where calls are destination to? You can see different MOS score qualities based upon the different gateways. You see your general call volume based upon the gateways itself. Kind of starting to break down and segment your traffic and your network into different areas. So looking at the floating bubble side, we see some variation there in the MOS score. In this case, a consistent bubble would be your MOS score is kind of holding constant on average. But you see the different variations there. So something's going on potentially in these different areas. So let's go ahead and jump to that link to kind of drill down into that. So it just took us to another dashboard giving us further details of what's going on. Here now we see uh, the disconnect reasons for the system itself and another bubble chart showing the MOS scores for those ingress trunk group calls going to the system here. Now what we can do is we can say, okay, well let's let's actually zoom in or filter this data based upon uh, let's, the little green one there, Walter, in the middle, RCH. So if we click on that and filter everything in this picture for that, we see all the data jumps in. And then at the bottom, you start seeing the additional call details of the system that give you the gateway, the trunk group, for the ingress side, the timestamp that it occurred, and give you kind of a level of how many calls were going on, where the calls completed, where calls failures, what are the minutes of use for that call, average hold time. So at this point, you could zoom in where we saw in the other detail of the data graph, and then now we know what trunk groups are kind of causing these problems, and we can then dispatch different operations teams, go to the different level if we need to check past records of these trunk groups, call the carrier that's connected to these trunk groups to ask them what's going on in the system, right? We could even jump to and start looking at the SIP messages that could be related to this. So as a part of our applications, you can go and see the call ladder diagrams because we can actually collect that from the system itself. Uh, under applications, uh, yep, I thought I had it already up. And in the Discover application, you go to your ladder diagrams. Right. Now you see here there's a vast range. In this case, Walter, we know there's some interesting ones if you go back, and I know we store data for several years uh, in this system here um, in particular, but we just want to show some particular data points. So if you could, yeah, go ahead, that's fine. Uh, apply. And do the search. I think your, your year date. There you go. So what you see here is these are multiple legs of calls in the system. So we actually collect the different legs from the SBC in this case, uh, the core ribbon SBC, and are pulling those different legs in. But as we are pulling those legs in, we are identifying the flows based upon the call ID of what, link, what links them all together. So in this case here, you see multiple call legs from the same call. So let's go ahead and hit the ladder diagram from one of those. And what Ribbon Protect is actually doing is pulling all that detail together and stitching those different legs of the calls all together. And in this case here, you see that there was an endpoint that made an invite into the SBC. The SBC did a trying back, and then it actually passed the invite on to another SBC and another endpoint. So we're stitching the legs here in this case of four different devices that are interacting with this call. Now for each and any one of these messages, you can click the little square there and see the, PD, uh, the PDU of the call itself. And you have the ability to search through it if you want to find something, or you can download and extract that PDU for your own purposes. You want to find the invites, kind of scroll through that. And you can bring up other invites too. So in this case, if you open, um, up, up, open that invite, yeah, that one there. 
So this is the invite after the SBC received it. And um, go ahead and slide that over so we can see the original invite. There you go. So open the other invite now. Yep. So what we're looking at now is we're looking at the invite that came into the original SBC. Then the SBC did something with it and made a new invite for that same call. So in this case, then you can do a comparison to see did something break here? Was something wrong in my SBC itself for the configurations that passed that invite on? Okay, go ahead and close these out. But you can do that for in each and every individual part of the leg, or at this level, you could download an actual picture of this if you want to include this in a case statement out to your carrier or for the other ops teams. You can also download all the PDUs from that system and include those also in the case management activity. So here then you'd get the text file of all that information. And as we are improving, we've had some feedback. Well, I want to see the PCAP. So yeah, we're working in adding the an export capability to export the PCAP level of this information out in the system there. So let's go ahead and jump to another call, Walter. Just let, take a look at another one. There you go. Let's try that one. So this one here in the system, it's a very simple call. Again, this one is not a problem. The call came in, you see the trying, the invite, then the ringing coming back from the endpoint through the SBC, the SBC doing the negotiation with the endpoint, and then a call that eventually canceled. Okay? Not too exciting here in this one. Okay? Go back to the uh, first page, Walter. Go ahead and close this one out and go to the first page. This one. Interesting. Yeah, now go ahead and close these out for a second. And scroll up. There you go. Familiar one there. Yep, yeah, open that one up. So I recall this one actually had a redirect in it. Yeah, so in this case, we have three different endpoint devices or application servers involved in this call through the SBC. The original call came in, the SBC sends the invite out, and then we get a 302 back. So assume in this case it's either an application server with a call forwarding, or it's a call redirect, a CRE engine, or a routing engine telling the SBC where to actually send this call. And then you can see the call going out to the system, and then the SBC, for its purposes, does stay in the call path, as it should, and it manages that. But now it's brokering it from the initial endpoint to the final endpoint the system there. And then obviously, if you had some problems, what was going on, you can do multiple comparisons of these different SIP messages. It gives you a lot of the operational control. So back to the why was the quality happening there. You can go through and do an analysis on, well, how long did it take for the calls to react with their SIP message delays, so on and so forth. Giving you the ability to drill down and kind of stop those quality threats. So really powerful in terms of being able to diagnose problems in the network. Absolutely. Very cool. All right. So, so Rich, just um, I, I think you've done an excellent job kind of walking through a lot of the, the big capabilities, um, looking for threats, looking for call quality issues. But what are some of the just the basic fundamental things that I can also do with the platform? Like, you know, can I export out some of these dashboards? Can I, uh, can I change the look and feel of the, of the graphs? Do my, am I stuck with kind of like what's already pre-configured? Sure. Okay, let's go back to one of the graphs real quick. One of those dashboards that we were looking at. So in any of the dashboards here, you have the ability that you see it here. You can share it with other users that are users of Protect. Or um, you can go ahead and open up one of them. Make them large. Expand. Uh, in the custom dashboard capability. Yep. There you go. So in this case, then, any of these dashboards you open up, let's go back to our network wide one. So here you see in the top right side a share button. So when you click that share button, that provides you a couple abilities here. You can either define interactive or non-interactive mode. So do you want people to be able to do filters, to drill down in the data, and be able to do the next stages of their own abilities there? Or do you want to be non-interactive where they're limited to only seeing the data that's provided there. 
And in that case, then, we have two availabilities. We, availabilities. we can share the link so they can do a direct link out to this data without having to go through the whole system itself. It can be protected and provided behind firewall capabilities and your own user logins or your customer user logins. Or you can embed this in your own customer dashboard. So this detailed data doesn't have to be processed by your operations team, generated on a weekly basis, and then submitted into a web front end for them to see. It can be linked directly from Protect to pull that data in real time for the customers. Oh, awesome. And then also a lot of this capability here, you can export the data. With this, the dashboard itself can be exported as screenshots, as a PDF file, or you can do the JSON version of the, cap of the system itself. If you go, this is exporting the dashboard itself. If you go in and go ahead and close this out and expand. So now in this case, if you go to an export, you're actually getting at the point where you can export the data and the details behind this. So we can send it as raw data and open up in any Excel or uh, spreadsheet application. We can get the chart data or, again, just capture a PDF or snapshot of this for uh, purposes of sharing. Uh, the other thing we didn't show is close the export. If you click on the data stuff and you hit the details, you can actually see the details on the graph itself behind the data. Just any click, yep, click in there. You see the different options there and you can see the details. Now actually pull the value numbers that are behind this into the system. And it lets you export this even if you wanted to. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you all. So also in this capability, we are looking at a fixed time in this case, but you have the ability to change it. But I want to look at just today's data, for example. I would click the, the, the today button, and the graph then would adjust the chart capability. We'll look at just today's data. I can look at the current year data. I can look at rolling data. I have lots of flexibility in how I want to view the data and show what I'm looking for or kind of dive down and see different trends, do comparisons, look for something that's changing in my network over time. The other ability that we talk here, this is, you see live there on the end, we have the ability to do bulk imports on historic data. So if you want to pull data from uh, something that occurred in the past and run some analysis to see what those key performance indicators or KPIs were done with those, we can do that and run graphs and provide information of that in the traffic analyzer capability. So if you want to see what was my uh, minutes of use at a trunk group level or something. I can do that based upon old data that maybe Protect wasn't installed at that time or you weren't monitoring it or you weren't even looking for it. You can actually go do that to provide you some tools and capabilities for your quality and your capacity planning capabilities of your network itself. Awesome. So that's really great, Rich. Um, sounds like a pretty powerful front end to be able to visualize the data um, across your entire UC network look for threats, but also quality issues, be able to uh, take the data in any way, shape, or form that, that you want to really kind of drill into. So I think that's what a lot of customers are, are asking for. So we're probably got about, you know, 10, 15 minutes left. I want to leave a couple of minutes for, for questions. Let's just kind of uh, wrap it up here. Um, I'm going to go back. Uh, to my uh, desktop and just kind of wrap things up um, yeah, some so is, yeah, their through. third session in the in the three session kind of involvement here um, I think we opened up with early talking about what are different threats what are the different stories what kind of occurs you know what things can happen in your network in some real live scenarios of that Right. Yep. So what are what would you say, you know, people that have kind of come to this webinar series, what would you say kind of the, the three things maybe that they should take away? Great. I'm glad you asked. And, and maybe the next three slides cover that. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so with that, first thing you want to do is it's all about pattern recognition. And you do that through behavior analytics. And that's all about big data. Uh, pulling in big data, pulling in mass amounts of big data, and then quickly processing them, looking for different patterns, 
applying algorithms, looking for different types of scenarios that you're trying to see. And that's really important. You need to be collecting the data and looking for uh, anomalies and behavior. Okay. And then with the ability to drill down into that, too. So not just collecting the data, but you have to drill into it, right? And beyond that is once you have that type of detection capability, secondly, you need to be able to do incident reporting. So being able to detect those different algorithms, using them, pull out what's going on, providing a clear visualization and details behind what happened with the incident, what is the incident, what's the threat of it, and then what are those drill down capabilities trying to get back to the forensics of what occurred, why it occurred, and who did what with it, right? Kind of the life cycle management. And then thirdly, just because I knew something happened, that's great. But in today's world, you need to be able to react to that quickly. And doing a weekly report or a monthly report on old billing records to see that some threat occurred, that um, the dentist office or what was it, the, uh, the one doctor's office, that had the huge $300,000 bill after a weekend's worth of traffic, you really need to be able to react to that quicker. You need to be able to track that and close those out, pushing policies, whether it's manual or automatic from your system down to your network to stop those threats before they cost you customers time and money. So that sounds really powerful to being able to um, mitigate down. I'm, I'm unaware of like anybody else, at least in a, a UC, real-time communications network that's doing that is, is anybody else kind of taking that innovative uh, approach that you're, you're aware of? Or? Well, there are several types of tools out there around threat intelligence and stuff, but a lot of them focus more on overall IP data and looking at larger levels of uh, IP intelligence, IP flows. Um, what we are trying to focus with our Ribbon for Tech product is really around voice and the VoIP technology because people are starting to, are trying to take advantage of the different protocols in the SIP stack that is at a higher application layer than just IP data streams. Right. So nobody else is really pushing policy back down into the network. No, not right. at the level that we are doing it, uh, yeah. covering the breadth right. of the different applications that we cover. Yeah especially when you're looking for TDOS or fraud or things of that nature, which are so dynamic and so hard to detect. Right. Uh, and especially for the ones when you're looking for events that the individual SBCs, for example, kind of identify, that whole network uh, neighborhood watch capability. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Rich. Um, so, Lance, uh, I think, uh, you know, we want to open it up for any type of questions that are out there. I know from last week, there was a question about um, uh, that we missed. It was about uh, this customer was being affected by uh, suspicious attacks, um, and he was also worried about because they had global traffic whether they were going to be kind of segmenting people outside that you know might be affected. Um, so they are not affected if they were to stop basically the subnets, you know, certain subnets from gaining access into the network. So maybe can you give a quick comment, you know, is something like Protect, could that help him, um, you know, as he's trying to detect these suspicious uh, uh, attacks and uh, while still allowing some of the good put traffic uh, to go through? Yeah, so a couple different paths could be taken in this. Actually, one of our examples that we showed, we were pushing bad SIP traffic into that system, um, which could be SIP vicious uh, or could be another simulator that's driving. What Protect would do is be able to see the information, whether it's excessive registration attempts, because it can see the SIP messages coming in, and then result in a similar type of CAC event, where I know that there shouldn't be more than X amount of registration occurring from the same actor at the same time over this detector period, and then push policies back down to the SBCs, depending upon the keeping of those SBCs, they could kind of ferret those out as opposed to a full IP address. I know in the policies that we showed in our examples are focused around IP addresses and DNs. Um, the control and the power that Protect provides is that we push provisioning or scripting capabilities in these policies down to the devices. So we could push whatever level we needed to based upon what that enforcer in the network can do. So if an SBC, for example, um, has the ability, which a lot of them do, to block subscribers or block certain agent types, we can push that policy back down into them. Very cool. All right, Lance, uh, what other questions do we have from the, the audience out there? 
Yeah, we just have a couple more to go through. Um, one was, do I need to install hardware or software probes uh, throughout the network to collect the RTC data? Great. So, so the question again is, do I have to deploy uh, hardware or software-based probes in my network for Ribbon Protect to work? Uh, in, in our case, so since we do have that background, uh, years of telephony, and we actually build a lot of these capable devices, Ribbon Protect is acting more as an OSS level system that's pulling the data directly out of the devices. Now that may not always be applicable, but particularly for Ribbon's devices, we are working that you do not need any probes at a software level or at a hardware level because in the case especially of our core SBC, it is the probe itself sending us the data and it can do that at line rate. So then you can then react and analyze the data without interfering with anything else going on in the network. Okay, and that kind of leads into the next question. Uh, someone asked, won't my SBCs protect the network against attacks? So yes, and what kind of occurs there is the SBCs are a very integral part. They are a SIP firewall, but they do not see everything that goes on on the other sides of the network, and they do not see stuff over history or aggregation points. So the difference here is an SDC are these point security devices, even firewalls, are looking at instances in time, right? And even small intervals, if you're looking at small CAC levels over a trunk group. What the ability that Protect brings to the table is, number one, it can do the neighborhood watch where it's looking at multiple devices in the network. It can detect either a distributed attack or an isolated attack in one side of the network and then apply policies across the network to prevent that from coming in another door. Or it also does a side of a, a, kind of a historical analysis around behavior analytics, right? Over time, it tracks what's going on and looking for anomalies. SBCs, individual devices, that's not their job. Their job is to process the call at the time it occurs and move it through there and then provide some protection capabilities on a limited time scale basis. Protect has a knowledge in history that can apply to the applications that's going on and help um, enhance or provide those additional fences. So just like in any uh, type of defense, right, you need rings of fences of protection capability. So the Protect really is uh, complementary to a SBC. You know, if when you're putting in a SIP network, you absolutely need to put in SBCs um, as kind of that, that front gate. Uh, point, but as Rich said, individually they will work to stop certain types of traffic. But if things come in underneath thresholds, you'll never know maybe about a DDoS attack or a registration storm or some type of um, uh, account hijacking that may be going on. But collectively, as you build up through the entire network, you'll be able to see that hey, something bad, anomalous is happening. Let's spread that policy to all of my network elements, um, whether they're SBCs or firewalls, to stop those bad actors from getting in. Okay. What else? Um, we have one other one talking about uh, someone has a mix of network devices, you know, throughout the network, hardware, software. How do they ensure that they're covering a hundred percent of the network with all these different platforms and devices? So I think it is, so. The way that Protect is built is it's agnostic in nature, meaning that you don't just have to have ribbon devices in your network, although that is preferred, um, obviously. But um, the ribbon Protect was built, and if we go back to the architecture that we discussed in the, the first series, we have these things called device interface gateways. And we can build those for really any type of device. We'll support third-party SBCs. Um, we'll support uh, firewalls uh, to be able to collect data from really any network device that's out there. And in the demonstrations we did today, we showed interactions with the Palo Alto firewall. For example. Okay. A good deal. Um, okay, uh, just two more. Uh, someone has a, a, a SIM platform, security information and event management platform. Uh, does Ribbon Solution complement it or does it replace it? Yeah, so we are not building a SIM system, right? We are focused on VoIP attacks and the mitigation of those attacks. 
we will provide interfaces up to a more comprehensive SIM system that takes all the data from the IP. I, I talked earlier about you know, the question around the competitive nature of this, and there are a lot of other systems out there that cover email and web traffic and stuff. Um, you kind of want to integrate all this together depending upon your network, your service that you're providing. If you're only providing a VoIP service, well, we're not a SIM, but Ribbon Protect may be the only system you need for mitigating those and managing them. If you provide a more comprehensive service, like I said, with email and other IP data sources, you would want to tie into a larger SIM system. And we have the northbound APIs that allow that to easily happen. And, and if we don't today, we can work with you to develop that API. We are a full web services type of architecture, which is important. What's the last one we have there, Lance? The last one is just uh, what other types of threats can uh, this platform detect and stop? So today we talked about TDOS. We talked about the network-wide um, events like SIP messages, bad SIP messages, um, and actually some of the questions, uh, excessive SIP registrations, uh, various different levels of SIP type of attacks um, we're adding to the system. We are continuously adding new detectors and fraud capability in the system itself because um, that stuff you you always have to keep track. You always have to keep up. For example, an antivirus software capability, you get monthly updates. Well, we'll be providing monthly updates, yearly builds, looking for new algorithms, looking for existing bad actors. Another one we actually do is we will work with uh, some of the popular robocalling databases out there, and we can monitor the networks for robocalls and nuisance calls and actually push blocks out to them without the traffic leaving your network. And that's kind of the key kind of tie-in we do with the robocalling. A lot of these providers out there that have the robocalling, you are required to push your traffic into them for them to analyze it, and then they can block it or not. Right? What we are doing is we kind of pull the database into the River Protect and then monitor your network for those calls and then push blocks into your network devices for the calls that are happening only on your network. So then your traffic and the data privacy of your customers are protected.